Researchers at Penn State recently received a three-year, $3.5 million grant to look at how to genetically engineer plants so they can detect harmful or chemical biological agents and warn us. Can plants act like the canary in the mine shaft? We'll find out. Let's take note with Jack Schultz, a chemical ecologist and professor of entomology in Penn State's College of Agricultural Sciences. Thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure. Long before bio warfare and homeland security were uh, a part of American everyday life, you were already studying plant communication. Tell us a little bit about what you were doing. Well, we've always been interested in how plants respond to insects. They sort of turn on defenses in, in the case of being attacked. So we noticed that plants that were not yet being attacked were also turning on their defenses when they were near attacked plants and discovered almost 20 years ago that they were emitting odors, volatiles into the air that cued nearby plants to turn on their defenses in advance. Now before we go any farther, explain you're a chemical ecologist. What is that? Well, ecologists are interested in how organisms interact with each other and with their environment. And so chemical ecologists study how chemistry influences those interactions or mediates them. So for example, uh, male moths find female moths by communicating with them chemically and and that's the kind of thing we're interested in. Okay, now you have been studying among other things how uh, trees might signal that they're under attack from insects. Tell us what is it that they do? Well, they uh, actually have the capability of perceiving and judging who the attacker is. They can even tell insect species apart. Uh, and they turn on the, the production of chemicals that they emit into the air. These chemicals are, uh, first of all, attractive to other insects that are enemies of the insects doing damage. Uh, and secondly, uh, they appear to signal to other plants that there's danger nearby and those other plants respond by beginning to synthesize their own defenses. So it's a kind of communication among plants. Now, we all know that, uh, that plants respond to stimuli. We've all seen flowers that open up in the sunshine, even some that open up at nighttime. Uh, but give us an idea of the, of the range of environmental cues that a plant could sense and then respond to. Well, the range is limited only by the number of questions that you ask. So far, uh, there's evidence of responses you can either see or detect with instruments to chemicals in the air, chemicals in the soil, uh, nutrient levels in soil. You know, most of us have had the experience of forgetting to fertilize or water the house plant that then begins to turn yellow. It's telling you what the soil is like. Um, attacked by insects, attacked by microbes, you know, diseases of various sorts, touch, uh, loud sounds, rock and roll perhaps, uh, we don't know. but. Uh, but almost anything anyone has attempted to uh, measure a response to has turned out to produce a measurable response on the part of plants. What's it taking to a lot of this uh, response is invisible to the naked eye? Yeah. What kind of sensing technology is required? Well, that's why chemical ecologists got involved. It really uh, takes instrumentation to see the kinds of chemical changes plants do because many of them are not visible, as you suggest. Uh, these molecules that are emitted into the air, for example, require some material uh, for trapping them, uh, then concentrating them, and we use you know, fairly sophisticated instrumentation, gas chromatography and mass spectrometry, to uh, identify and separate those molecules. Now, how quickly after a tree, for example, is under attack from caterpillars or what have you, do they send out the volatiles? How, how quickly is the response and a response that you can actually measure? Well, let, let's, uh, let's divide that into two categories. Uh, the measurable response, if uh, what we're looking for are the kinds of things that, that we've discussed so far, uh, fairly significant chemical changes or movement even on the part of the plant, uh, take hours to days. Uh, however, the genes that underlie those responses go on in a matter of minutes. And one reason we're interested in potentially manipulating the plants is to link those early responding genes to plant characteristics so we can see them right away. So in other words, make them glow like a jellyfish when they're under well, attack. Well, that's, yeah, that's the, the most... Or turn a different <laughs> color. That's, that's perhaps the most fun example, yes. Uh, well, you know, plants, uh, the color changes we see in the fall uh, are a programmed activity by the plant. It's, you know, the plants are doing that for a purpose. It usually involves breaking down materials that they need to store for the winter to use next year to build new leaves. Um, we now understand how the plant does that sort of thing, and you can actually reschedule it. Uh, uh, and what we're aiming at is potentially, at least one of the aims, is to link uh, the basis of that kind of response to some kind of uh, ability to sense something more interesting in the environment. Speaking of more interesting in the environment, you say that the potential exists to have plants uh, sense and respond to landmines, for example. That's right. Uh, actually, uh, it's one of our undergraduate honors thesis projects to uh, identify uh, the genes that are going on and off in 
uh, the plant, uh, the mouse ear cress, Arabidopsis, uh, sort of a model for these kinds of studies, uh, when those plants are grown on soils contaminated by landmine explosives. Landmines are very leaky, and they're, they're mostly made of plastic these days. And uh, the TNT, explosives in the mine, leak into the soil where they degrade into compounds that actually act as fertilizer for plants. Uh, so once we can sort of catalog the kinds of responses plants may exhibit when they're growing on that kind of soil, we should be able to, first of all, uh, detect responses that are already natural. Uh, we just haven't looked for them before. And secondly, link, again, the genes underlying those responses to plant traits that are more visible, like color change, so an aerial projects. view of an area that you suspect has landmines might reveal exactly. where exactly they are. Exactly, that's right. Mm -hmm. Now, you have said that plants make ideal sentinels because they can't run. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we know mm -hmm. that dogs can be used uh, right. to detect cancer in a human or the canary in the mine shaft. If uh, carbon monoxide is present, they're, yeah. they're good indicators. How would plants, in your opinion, compare with animals in sensing these things? Well, let's think about it in several different ways. One is that uh, because plants can't move around, they sort of have to be able to detect things that happen to them. Anything that comes along, they have to be able to deal with. So as a consequence of that, you would sort of expect them to be very um, responsive to their environments because they really don't have any choice. Um, that seems to have resulted in the evolution of a very large number of sensors in every cell of plants. Uh, they have more sensors of the kind that dogs use to detect odors than dogs do. So uh, what we anticipate is that plants are probably more sensitive to a wider range of signals than even animals are, uh, but no one's ever looked before. Uh, we'll be the first to separate all those sensors and, and ask what can each one of them detect. And in fact, you recently received $3.5 million uh, from the uh, Department of Defense to, to work on these kinds of things. How confident are you that the kinds of research you can develop will be worthy of that kind of an investment? Oh, uh, it's uh, going to be worthy, I think, even if the defense applications don't work out uh, in two ways. One is, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, these uh, receptors or sensors that plants have, have are practically unstudied. We only know about what six of them do, and there are over 600 of them in a, in a small plant. Uh, there's a huge basic science benefit to determining uh, how the plant works, essentially. Uh, but the kinds of applications that we find particularly interesting are those in agriculture, because uh, in agriculture right now we're, we're confronted with a situation that uh, we have a hard time figuring out where the pests are at a given moment in a given field. And the usual uh, remedy for an infestation by something is to treat the entire field with chemicals that have a relatively broad environmental impact, usually negative. Uh, precision agriculture is an approach to agricultural uh, cultivation and so forth that, that tries to pinpoint the problem and treat it only when and where it exists. Uh, what we're very much interested in is determining to what degree plants, for, exa for example crops in a field, can tell us where they're experiencing problems of various sorts. Is there an insect here? Is there a disease there? Uh, do we need fertilization in this corner of the field and not another? Uh, these receptors that we're studying are the basis of the plant's ability to know those things, if you want to put it that way. Um, and what we need to do is turn that into a report that we can see. Now, the Union of Concerned Scientists says that plant sentinels are, quote, pie in the sky. They say even if uh, the Aridopsis responds to unfamiliar bacteria, does that mean that other plants can be made to do the same? They go on to say, considering the difficulties of getting plants to grow, uh, couldn't these sentinel plants die of drought, drown in, in wet conditions, for example? And what about if they escape into the, into the wild? Well, there's a lot of questions there. Um, first of all, um, this kind of thing is actually already being done with bacteria. Uh, bacteria have been engineered and released to, among other things, to find landmines, uh, doing exactly the same thing. The bacteria can use and detect explosives in the soil, and they've been engineered to glow. The problem is that actually, compared to a plant, they don't grow nearly as well under difficult conditions. Drought, flooding, and so forth are a real problem for bacteria. Um, and we're sort of aiming at a system in which the plant is adapted to a particular site. Um, it may be a desert site, um, and the plant is, you know, uh, the plant that is used is one that is already adapted to that site and can deal with it. Uh, I want to hasten to point out that uh, engineering the plant isn't the only goal of this this kind of project. Uh, that's, uh, you know, in many ways the more visible part of it. 
Um, but actually, we, we really hope to be able to read naturally occurring vegetation as well. In fact, if you think about it, in a combat situation, you don't have time to plant plants Correct. and let them grow and so forth. So the idea there is to develop the means to determine what naturally occurring plants can detect and what they say about it so that you can develop, for example, a, an instrument to tell you what's happened. Um, the engineering part of this is probably going to be most useful in other applications. Um, for example, humanitarian demining, where you can sow seeds in a field, and when the plants begin to grow, they tell you where the mines are. Now, in, in addition to what the Union of Concerned Scientists say, uh, Molly John of Cornell University, who, a plant breeder, says that it's a little delusional to imagine that plants will offer us information in a form and with a response time that will allow us to protect ourselves. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, some of these responses t are accomplished in a matter of minutes. Um, and in fact, uh, in other work that we do related to this, we find that this very plant responds to things like aphids and bacteria in a matter of minutes to hours. Uh, so I don't think that's much of a concern. The, the larger issues are, first of all, uh, will the plant do something we can detect? And the combination of bringing engineering to bear on detecting what plants do and designing plants for brighter, louder, smellier kinds of responses is our approach to solving that problem. Uh, we haven't really addressed the what about the, the question of uh, transgenic plants in the natural world. Uh, we all are aware of the controversy surrounding that. Uh, the evidence is still accumulating about whether that's a net positive or negative. Uh, but I must point out that with the kinds of things we can do with this uh, design of plants today, these plants could all be dead and gone in a matter of two days if that's what you really wanted to accomplish. So uh, I'm not really too concerned about the real dangers, uh, but public perception is always an issue. With just a couple of seconds remaining, if this turns out that the Sentinel plants turn out to ha be as promising as, as you hope, where do you think they'll be used? What's the application in front of airports and homes? Yeah. Where? Well, there's a great deal of interest in deploying plants uh, in sensitive places where you would like to know if a material has been deposited or appeared recently. Uh, house plants could be used this way. Uh, your suggestion of airports is another way. Uh, but I, I really think, I'm really looking forward to the potential application in agricultural settings, both as a way of detecting potential agricultural terrorism and naturally occurring pest problems. And on that note, we're out of time. Thank you so much for being with us. Our guest has been Jack Schultz. He's a chemical ecologist with Penn State. For Take Note, I'm Patty Satalia. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.